Welcome from San Diego, California. We are reaching you in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, live through a unique and complex international telecommunications network via satellite, microwave, and cable. The International Training Center at San Diego State University brings us together once again through this original video conference program, which joins distinguished organizations representing education, business, and government in Mexico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina. We also welcome Spain, the United States of America, the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C., and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, known as UNCTAD, in Geneva, Switzerland. During our program today, we will examine the subject of the art and culture of risk-taking. This is the tenth video conference of the year 2001 series on the art and culture of risk-taking. I'm Richard Page of the Page Firm, a law firm specializing in international business litigation, arbitration, and mediation. I am your moderator for today's program, and I look forward to learning more about the art and culture of risk-taking from our presenters. Identifying risks and anticipating negative outcomes at an individual, organizational, and community level is increasingly a challenging proposition given the changing and globalized nature of our society today. But successful leaders and decision makers almost by definition are effective risk takers. They all belong to a club that has mastered the art and culture of calculated risk management and optional resource allocation. This video conference will present and analyze the competencies of a good risk taker, the tools and techniques used to manage risk, including audit programs, critical assessment, and organizational continuity plans. The speakers will also review key issues of costs, human resource training, and specialized crisis assistance all successful organizations need to consider to minimize their liabilities and maximize their capacity to react to internal and external crises and contingencies. Functional optimization also includes health, safety, and biopsychosocial care of human resources to reduce stress, disease, and conflict in the workplace. Crises and emergencies are almost always a direct result of human error and conflict. A new, more individualized and customized care approach is proposed to enhance productivity and minimize organizational risk. During our first module, Nigel Brooks looks at developing a culture for risk taking. In our second module today, Dan Hopwood discusses the methodology and models for risk taking. Let me introduce our presenters for today's program. Nigel Brooks is a lecturer at the School of Communication at San Diego State University focusing on relational communication. He is also a trainer and coach at the San Diego Consulting Group. His areas of specialization include holistic health, aesthetics, coaching, and training, the inseparability of body, mind, self, community, and ecology. Throughout his career, he has presented papers and documentary films at 10 academic conferences and he received the San Diego State Outstanding Graduate Award for 1997. Mr. Brooks is active in a number of organizations, including the American Society for Training and Development and the Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction. He is also involved in the local community as a performer and as a community service worker through developing community art education projects. Nigel holds a Master's of Art in Communication from San Diego State University. Nigel, welcome to the ITC program series. We look forward to your insights. 
Thank you. Our second presenter today is Dan Hopwood. He is a managing consultant with Arab Risk Consulting, an international engineering and management consulting firm. Dan is a longtime associate of the International Training Center, having been both a speaker and a frequent program moderator. In addition to his work with the ITC, he has a long-standing relationship with San Diego State University and the San Diego community, having developed safety, health, and emergency response and disaster planning curricula for the SDSU College of Extended Studies, leading to professional certificates. For the past few years, Dan has been a part-time faculty member for SDSU's Community Health Education Degree Program, teaching safety and accident prevention classes. Dan's areas of specialization include business continuity planning, safety, health, and emergency response planning, crisis management and business recovery, strategic planning, education, and training. Dan has been very active in both the safety and business continuity community, having held elective and appointed offices, including that of chairman of the Pacific Safety Council. Mr. Hopwood has authored several peer-reviewed papers and has spoken on a variety of safety, risk management, and business continuity topics throughout the United States. Dan holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science and Safety and a Master's of Science in Public Health from the Graduate School of Public Health at San Diego State University. Before we begin our first module, I would like to ask our speakers to comment on the way that organizations especially smaller ones, have to deal with what seems like a much higher level of risk now than just 10 years ago. As the workflow within organizations becomes more optimized and the economy in general becomes more streamlined, it seems that we become more exposed to risk than ever before. Also, successful leaders and decision makers, almost by definition, are effective risk takers. Is this true? Is there a difference between how organizations in education business and government should deal with the increasing levels of risk? Nigel? Well, I think that in a global economy, which is characterized obviously by continuous change, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit must adapt and therefore be creative and take risks, and leaders of these organizations must lead by taking risks. I think if you look to ancient China, their philosophy of Taoism communicates leadership through an axiom that they use, which states that a great leader leads by looking to his or her people, defining their dreams, their goals, and then leading them to where they want to go, such that when they accomplish something, they look at what has been accomplished and say, look at what we have done. I think that Taoism is an ancient view of a systems approach, such that the leader understands that he has to negotiate multiple viewpoints and take risk by negotiating within that framework. Dan? Well, let me take the, the part, Dick, about the difference between large and small organizations. And what we'll talk about today on, on one hand is that the categories of risk that organizations are exposed to, whether large or small, are not different. They are the same. It's how you attack them that might be different, and clearly the difference between large and small organizations rests with access to resources and how you use resources to overcome risk or to manage risk, if you will. So one of the things that, that becomes, I think, increasingly important for small organizations <clears throat> excuse me, is to, de is to detail and create internal capabilities as opposed to looking outside, and, and that becomes uh, an essential characteristic of the difference between the two. Thank you very much for your answers. Now let's go to Module 1, where Nigel will look at how organizations can develop a culture for risk-taking. Thank you. I would like to begin my presentation with a bit of history. This history will illustrate how risk and risk management has always played a key role in the development of societies, organizations, and individuals. This has been true since the beginning of recorded civilization. In fact, we have found that societies and organizations can benefit from taking calculated risks, and that those that have a culture that allows risk-taking can reap 
tremendous rewards. By 5000 BC, the people of North Africa's Nile Basin had begun a centuries-long movement from nomadic hunter-gathering and subsistence farming towards what we call civilization. A marker event occurred 2,000 years later when the celebrated god king Narmer of the Upper Nile spread his political, military, and religious dominion north out of the Nubian highlands to encompass the kingdom of the Lower Nile Delta. The palate of King Narmer, circa 3100 BC, commemorates this cultural consolidation, signifying the emergence of the first dynasty and an aesthetic form of representation we think of as quintessentially Egyptian. In 1375 BC, a radically new outlook tried to assert itself in the person of Amenhotep IV, a genius, a heretic, or a madman, depending on the historical perspective. In a direct refutation of the powerful polytheistic priesthood of Amun-Ra, the pharaoh changed his name from Amenhotep, meaning Amun is pleased, to Akhenaten, meaning spirit of Aten, and reframed Egyptian theology as an abstract monotheism under the universal sun god Aten. This revolution initiated a more reflective cultural atmosphere, exemplified by an extreme departure in the manner and content of Egyptian art. The chronic hieroglyphic rigidity first glimpsed in the palette of King Narmer, often depicting military victories and glorifying the hierarchy of the pharaohs and the various gods, became fluid, naturalistic, and depicted scenes from everyday life. The new sun god, Aton, was represented as a solar disk, radiating beams of light, terminating in hands holding onks. The solar disk shone on the pharaoh and his family, who were relaxed, intimate, kissing babies, reclining and feeding each other. Aton was not just the god of the Nile, or of a particular city, but was the universal life force by which all rivers and all cities came to be. Under Akhenaten's rule, artisans were granted a limited freedom to take aesthetic risks, to recreate the culture under the new ethos, to represent history, everyday life, and indeed meaning itself through their ability to observe and imagine, rather than through a stifling tradition. Historians call this Egyptian Renaissance the Armana period. Both the Armana style and Akhenaten's single-minded reign, however, lasted only 20 years. After the death of Akhenaten, the old priesthoods reasserted their power and reclaimed their positions of privilege. The name of Akhenaten was chiseled from the temple walls and expunged from the official history. And the aesthetic dimension of Egyptian culture, while retaining some hints of the new, also retreated into traditional styles of representation, as evidenced by the relief carving Seti I offering, carved some 30 years after Akhenaten's death. For the next one and a half millennia, the larger Egyptian culture steered clear of monotheism and followed the path of its polytheistic traditions. Nevertheless, the monotheistic tradition did not die and, in fact, grew into arguably the most powerful influence in the history of the world. The monotheistic tradition is attributed to the Hebrews, Christians, and Muslims. It is their cultural legacy. But it might have been different. If Egypt had taken the risk of Akhenaten's vision, taking risks does not ensure success but an absence of all risk-taking ensures eventual failure. The symbolism of Egypt's heretic pharaoh is a timeless allegory for our contemporary world. The ability to take risk, to imagine beyond the status quo, is not a genetic trait specific 
to certain individuals. It is a tendency that is either stifled or nourished within the cultural context out of which a status quo emerges. The aesthetic environment and social performances within organizations reflect underlying values that, to varying degrees, favor creativity, play and change, or rules, hierarchies, and consistency. No organization or civilization can simply be one way or the other. But the amount of flexibility encouraged by a culture will correlate with its capacity to adapt to a complex world that guarantees nothing except the inevitability of change. The process of envisioning something and the risk-taking needed to manifest that vision is an act of creativity. And according to psychologist Rolla May, creativity requires courage. We might also add that it requires a social context that encourages acts of courage. May describes four types of courage. Physical courage, squarely facing physical harm. Moral courage, a willingness to stand up for what's right. Social courage, a willingness to accept the risks of establishing intimacy. And what he says is the most important type, creative courage, the challenge of discovering and working with new forms and symbols which can initiate systems change. He also describes an important paradox of courage. May claims courage requires us not only to be fully committed, but also aware of the possibility of being wrong. Thus, legitimate courage, creativity, and risk-taking occurs not without doubt, but in spite of doubt. It is possible Akhenaten had no doubt because his culture revered pharaohs as infallible gods. In our post-pharaonic world, however, organizational cultures need to communicate to their mortal and imperfect members a support for risk taking in order to mitigate the level of doubt that would otherwise prevent creative behavior. This can be initiated by thinking intelligently about what I call the anesthetic atmosphere of a culture. Anesthetics is a term I use to describe a quality of social spaces that stimulates and or suppresses artistic endeavors. Derived from my study of artists, I argue that all people have an inherent yet often unrealized need to be creative and craft spaces that are inspiring and sacred to them. An aesthetic dimension arouses creativity and motivates the risk of imaginative endeavors. An anesthetic dimension anesthetizes the mind and dulls the imagination so people settle for simply going along to get along. The freshness of images from the Armana period was the product of artists living in an evolving aesthetic dimension. Herbert Marcuse argues the aesthetic dimension is important because it is more, as well as qualitatively other, than the established reality. Only in the illusory world do things appear both as what they are and what they can be. Bell Hooks stresses the profound effect of aesthetics within social settings. Although relief carvings from the Armana period can evoke powerful impressions, Hooks claims that aesthetics are not best contained in the enduring art object, but rather in the moment of experience, of human interaction, the passion or remembrance that serves as a catalyst urging on the will to create. Art making is thus not simply the domain of professional artists. It is a synonym for human creativity and risk-taking. Moreover, an appreciation of anesthetics implies that risk-taking is not limited simply to an organizational action, such as marketing a new product, but also involves the admitted risk 
of fostering a culture where all participants are invited to think outside the box. For example, does the organization provide time and social space to dream without a chronic fixation on productivity? Many business organizations find themselves facing a seeming paradox. How to thrive in a for-profit environment while convincing its members to take risks that could potentially erode profitability. Some companies may talk the talk of valuing risk without walking the walk of demonstrating genuine support for employees who take risks. This discrepancy between organizational rhetoric and reality generates additional paradoxes for workers that Stoll and Cheney call dilemmas of organizational democracy. For example, members may be told in meetings and through newsletters that they have been empowered to make decisions and follow through on them, while simultaneously knowing that the successful organizational members still seek official approval before ever moving forward. The informal messages conveyed through observation and storytelling carry more weight than the formal messages, and members are thus anesthetized against risk-taking and creative decision-making. Not only are members in such a scenario less likely to take risks, but according to Stoll and Cheney, the cognitive dissonance entailed by the paradox makes them less productive than if they were not officially empowered in the first place. Two organizations that can serve as case studies of cultures that support risk or resist risk are Southwest Airlines and Xerox, respectively. Southwest Airlines was born of risk in an industry that has experienced great chaos in the forms of government deregulation, frequent price wars, and intermittent walkout strikes. Southwest Airlines has thrived by committing to an ambiguous vision of outrageous customer service without attaching itself to formulas of how that vision should look. Xerox was also born of risk, introducing the revolution of photocopies in the late 1950s. Its leader also had a long-term radical vision in the 1960s of creating the office of the future. But traditional formulas and business practices reasserted themselves after that leader's demise. And the office of the future became the product of competitors such as IBM, Apple, and Microsoft. Xerox became a microcosm of a post Akhenaten Egypt, while Southwest Airlines struggles to make ongoing risk a part of its cultural narrative. We can view the cultural narratives of Xerox and Southwest Airlines and their anesthetic attitudes as examples of modern and postmodern organizations modeled by Eisenberg and Goodall. Postmodern describes a cultural transition constituted by change, uncertainty, vulnerability, and the discovery and working with new forms and symbols which are characteristic of creative risk taking. In their 1988 book, Fumbling the Future, Douglas Smith and Robert Alexander tell the story of the meteoric rise and subsequent complacency of a culture with a household name. In 1959, the Xerox Corporation, then called Halloid, produced the first xerography prototype, what we now think of as the ubiquitous office photocopy machine. This constituted a radical improvement over the ditto machines and carbon copies that had previously permeated office culture. 
during the early 1960s, as the first copiers were being shipped to buyers all over the world, Xerox, in the absence of competition, came to dominate a global market they had created. Like the old kingdom of ancient Egypt, Xerox saw a world ripe for the picking. By the late 1960s, riding on top of the office communication industry, CEO Joe Wilson and his president, Peter McCallu, were envisioning an office of the future, built on an architecture of information. In a manner similar to the ideas of Akhenaten, the fruition of this vision would take Xerox away from stable, self-replicating patterns of organizational behavior and into an unknown future. Although they had created their business through risk, courage, and creativity, their relatively uncontrolled growth compelled them to hire risk-intolerant management from traditional companies to establish conventional structures of budgeting and investment. Nevertheless, under the leadership of Wilson and McCallu, the aesthetic oasis of the Palo Alto Research Center, otherwise known as PARC, was opened in June of 1970. The culture of PARC emerged from the participation of academics and young computer engineers who were influenced by the cultural renaissance taking place to the north in San Francisco and Berkeley. By 1973, the Alto computer had been invented, a clear harbinger of the office technologies of the 1980s and beyond. Out of an aesthetic in which designers were free to take risks, emerged not only a prototype of the common personal computer, but several other features many 21st century office workers would easily recognize. The state-of-the-art Alto transcended mere arithmetic calculations by including user-friendly word processing, a hand-operated mouse, keyboard, laser printer, graphic interface screen applications, as well as Ethernet and email connections to other Alto workstations. Unfortunately for Xerox, Joe Wilson and his visionary leadership died two and a half years before Alto's invention. And as replacement CEO, Peter McCallu had delegated the administration of manufacturing, marketing, and sales to bean counters who had, in the words of one park engineer, a belief in management by numbers and concern for control that made them virtually intolerant of risk, a perspective fundamentally opposed to novel technology. The Alto was never marketed. The cyber visionaries at Park lobbied hard for many years to have their inventions produced and sold to a business world they believed would be transformed by their work. Unfortunately, the power to make the necessary decisions and follow through on them rested in the hands of a few men who did not share Park's dream. In 1979, Apple computer founder Steve Jobs took a tour of the Palo Alto facility and then recruited many of the unfulfilled designers from Park to launch the Apple Lisa in 1983 and the Macintosh shortly after that. Monotheism changed the world, and so did the personal computer. But the cultures that first introduced them lacked the creative courage to risk their stability and comfortable practices and then follow the potential of those respective visions. Although Peter McCallu demonstrated creative risk in his collaboration with Joe Wilson, discovering and working with the new forms and symbols that signified the office of the future, after Wilson's death, he abdicated the responsibility to nurture a culture that would see its fruition. The engineers at Park were like the Armana-influenced artisans who continued to flavor their craft with the new aesthetic in the immediate aftermath of Akhenaten's death. 
they believed in the radical vision and worked in their own way to see it realized. But their work was constrained within a culture that favored the established patterns of tradition. And they were culturally disempowered by the resurgent authority of Amun Ra's priesthood or modernist business management practices. Following the variables from the previously mentioned Eisenberg and Goodall model, we can interpret Xerox's behavior regarding its park division as characteristic of a modern organization. Park's tasks were highly specialized. They were mandated only to design technology without being empowered to influence the promotion, development, manufacturing, or marketing of that technology.